It was September 1st, 1859. A man by the name of Richard Carrington went into his private observatory on his estate and looked through his telescope at the sky. What he saw was, and I quote, two patches of intensely bright and white light. These had erupted from the darkened sunspots he had seen only moments earlier. Five minutes after the event had started, the light reduced back to its normal state. But this was just the beginning. This was the Carrington event. So what happened? What caused this effect? And how did it impact the planet? It's time to learn something new. To understand the Carrington event, we have to understand a little bit about our sun. The sun is a star, specifically it is a G2 yellow dwarf star based on its temperature and the wavelengths of light it emits. It's also important to know that the sun is gaseous, and its surface consists of three parts. The photosphere, the part of the sun which we can see, the chromosphere, further away from the surface than the photosphere, yet burning hotter, and the corona, an extremely hot outer layer. Occasionally, dark, cooler areas will appear on the photosphere as a result of the interaction between the sun's surface plasma with its magnetic field. These are called sunspots. They tend to be around 6,380 degrees Fahrenheit, which is approximately 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than the rest of the sun. This can allow them to act as a cap, containing intense energy from the sun beneath them. As the magnetic field lines of the sun become more warped, they twist and can cross, releasing all of the energy that had built up beneath the sunspot. The amount of energy released in that instant is the equivalent of millions of hydrogen bombs exploding all at the same time. It's millions of degrees as the explosion rockets energized particles into space. These are called solar flares. This happens fairly regularly, but it isn't a constant event. There are actually cycles of the sun where the solar flares can get greater or smaller. These cycles are pretty regular, taking place every 11 years. Thankfully, space is big, and most of the time the solar flares are sent off into space and come nowhere near the planet. Sometimes, those solar flares are pointed right at us. So how big can these solar flares get, and how strong are they? The classifications are confusingly A, B, C, M, and X. The lowest class possible is the A-class solar flare, that's basically equivalent to the background noise of the overall activity on the sun. However, similar to the Richter scale used to measure earthquakes, with each level increase in the solar flare intensity, the effects are tenfold in the increase in energy output. So a C level is 10 times stronger than a B, and 100 times stronger than an A class. Within each of these classes, there is a subscale of one through nine, with the exception of the largest class, X. Since it's the biggest, it can go up to whatever level they need it to, instead of making a class above. So remember, the higher the number, the more dangerous. A, B, and C class solar flares actually don't have any noticeable impacts on Earth that the average person can see, although NASA, NOAA, and the US Weather Agency are tracking every level constantly. M class is where we can start to notice some damaging effects. Keep in mind, M is 10,000 times greater in energy output than A. This is where, here on Earth, wherever the energy hits there are short and sporadic outages in the radio. In space, during M class, astronauts won't go outside the space station because it could cause dangerous levels of radiation poisoning. Then there are the big ones. X class solar flares are much more noticeable here on Earth, although they are pretty rare. As mentioned earlier, there are solar flares more than 10 times more energetic than X, and when this happens, they will just say it's an X10 class solar flare. The most powerful solar flare that was measured with modern equipment took place in 2003. It registered to be an X28 before overloading the equipment NASA was using to measure it. These X class solar flares are the biggest explosions that can happen in our solar system, and they are crazy to watch. Loops come off the sun that are 10 times the size of Earth and can produce as much energy as 1 billion hydrogen bombs going off at once. If these are pointed at the Earth, they can disrupt satellites, pretty much every form of communication, and even power grids. Okay, now with all that in mind, we can return to the Carrington event. 
After Richard Carrington witnessed the sunspots erupting into the biggest solar flare ever documented, things went back to normal for a few hours. Unbeknownst to him and the rest of humanity, however, was that the energized particles from the solar flare were hurtling straight for Earth. That night, telegraph communications began to fail, but they didn't just stop working. Sparks began showering from the telegraph machines and set some buildings on fire. Interestingly enough, though, despite many telegraph lines going down, the operators found that they could unplug their batteries and still transmit from Boston to Portland, Maine, because the atmosphere was so full of energy. This system didn't work as well as using the telegraph lines, but still was very useful to send the most urgent and important messages. In the night sky, from France to Australia, red, green, and purple auroras began to appear. They were so bright that birds began to chirp as if believing the sun was coming up, and a newspaper could easily be read, despite it being the middle of the night. Although, some believed that the world was about to end. A woman who lived on Sullivan's Island in South Carolina reported in their local newspaper that the eastern sky appeared of a blood red color. The whole island was illuminated. The sea reflected the phenomenon and no one could look at it without thinking of the passage in the Bible which says, the sea turned to blood. The shells on the beach resembled coals of fire. The Northern Lights extended so extremely far south, being seen in the Bahamas, Cuba, Jamaica, and Hawaii. In another city in South Carolina, there were reports of masons waking up and beginning to lay bricks at job sites, and miners in Colorado heading to the mines before they realized it was still the middle of the night. Recently, ice core samples have determined that the Carrington event was part of the largest solar storm in the last 500 years to hit Earth, dwarfing even the second largest impacts. On July 23, 2012, a Carrington-class superstorm did occur once again. It barely missed Earth, prompting research to study the effects of a modern Carrington event occurring. Researchers found that nearly all of the satellites being sent into orbit have little protection from the solar flare of that magnitude. Their advice, have spare satellites ready to launch in the event that a large solar flare knocks out all of our current satellite communications. On the ground, it could cause anywhere from 600 billion to 2.6 trillion in damage to the United States alone. Power restorations could take anywhere from a few weeks to nearly a year in some areas. The reason why our power grid can become vulnerable is actually for the same reason why it's so protected from lightning strikes. We have added ground connections to our transformers to dissipate the energy from lightning strikes, but this also serves as an avenue for geomagnetically induced currents from the electrons flung off of the sun during a solar flare. So is there any way to prevent the power grid from going down during a serious X-class solar flare? There actually are methods electric companies can use, like installing the critical transformers with resistors or capacitors, but this can cause hundreds of thousands per transformer, so it doesn't happen. The best we can hope for is that, if there is an event, the electric companies receive enough of a warning to scale back power generation to reduce the effects the solar flare will have on the power grid. At most, this time period could be a full day, and in the worst case scenario, they might have 10 minutes advance notice, so it's clearly not the best system. Other devastating effects include electronic payment processors not working, causing people to have to rely solely on cash to make purchases. ATMs, which rely on the internet or satellites to verify account information, would be down as well. Charging stations would be down, making electric vehicles essentially useless until the grid can come back up. Plane navigation would experience constant errors as well as an inability to communicate with towers, on the ground, or other flights. Basically, right now, we are crossing our fingers and hoping that a Carrington event won't come and devastate our societies that have increasingly become more and more reliant on electricity, satellites, and the internet. Luckily, chances are low that it will happen again for a long time, so I'd rank this one pretty low on your list of things to worry about. How would you fare if you didn't have access to electricity or the internet? Let's talk about it down in the comments below. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. 
If you liked the video, please consider liking and subscribing. And don't forget to check out our other videos, 